continuing in our reading of The Ten Commandments by Thomas Watson, originally printed in 1692, Part 4, The Way of Salvation, continuing reading on the Lord's Supper. A question, what are the principal reasons for self-examination before we approach the Lord's Supper? First, it is a duty imposed, let him examine himself. The Passover was not to be eaten raw, Exodus 12:9. To come to such an ordinance slightly without examination is to come in an undue manner, and is like eating the Passover raw. Second, we must examine ourselves before we come, because it is not only a duty imposed, but opposed. There is nothing to which the heart is naturally more averse than self-examination. We may know that duty to be good which the heart opposes. But why does the heart so oppose it? Because it crosses the tide of corrupt nature and is contrary to flesh and blood. The heart is guilty, and does a guilty person love to be examined? The heart opposes it, therefore the rather set upon it. For that duty is good which the heart opposes. Third, because self-examination is a needful work. Without it a man can never tell how it is with him, whether he has grace or not, and this must needs be very uncomfortable. He knows not if he should die presently what will become of him, to what coast he shall sail, whether to hell or heaven, as Socrates said, I am about to die, and the gods know whether I shall be happy or miserable. How needful, therefore, is self-examination, that a man by search may know the true state of his soul, and how it will go with him to eternity. Self-examination is needful with respect to the excellence of the sacrament. Let him eat of that bread, that excellent bread, that consecrated bread, that bread which is not only the bread of the Lord, but the bread the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.28 Let him drink of that cup, that precious cup, which is perfumed and spiced with Christ's love, that cup which holds the blood of God sacramentally. Cleopatra put a jewel in a cup which contained the price of a kingdom. This sacred cup we are to drink of, enriched with the blood of God, is above the price of a kingdom. It is worth more than heaven. Therefore, coming to such a royal feast, having a whole Christ, both his divine and human nature to feed on, how should we examine ourselves beforehand that we may be fit guests for such a magnificent banquet? Self-examination is needful because God will examine us. That was a sad question. Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? Matthew 22:12. Men are loth to ask themselves the question, O oh, my soul, art thou a fit guest for the Lord's table? Are there not some sins thou hast to bewail? Are there not some evidences for heaven that thou hast yet to get? Now, when persons will not ask themselves the question, then God will bring the question to them. How came you in hither to my table not prepared? How came you in hither with an unbelieving or profane heart? Such a question will cause a heart trembling. God will examine a man as the chief captain would Paul with scourging. Acts 22.24 it is true that the best saint, if God should weigh him in the balance, would be found wanting, but when a Christian has made an impartial search and has labored to deal uprightly between God and his own soul, Christ's merits will cast in some grains of allowance into the scales. Self-examination is needful because of secret corruption in the heart, which will not be found out without searching. There are in the heart, as Augustine, hidden pollutions— it is with a Christian as with Joseph's brethren, who, when the steward accused them of having the cup, were ready to swear that they had it not, but upon search it was found in one of their sacks. Little does a Christian think what pride, atheism, uncleanness is in his heart until he searches it. If there be therefore such hidden wickedness like a spring running underground, we had need examine ourselves that, finding out our secret sin, we may be humbled and repent." Hidden sins, if not searched out, defile the soul. If corn lie long in the chaff, the chaff defiles the corn. So sins long hidden defile our duties. Needful, therefore, it is become me coming to the Lord's Supper beforehand. Search out these hidden sins, as Israel searched for leaven before they came to the Passover. Self-examination is needful, because without it we may easily have a cheat put upon us. The heart, Jeremiah 
17.9 is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Many a man's heart will tell him he is fit for the Lord's table. As when Christ asked the sons of Zebedee, Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? Matthew 20.22 20, Can ye drink such a bloody cup of suffering? They say unto him, We are able. So the heart will suggest to a man he is fit to drink of the sacramental cup. He has on the wedding garment. The heart is, is a grand impostor, says Augustine. As a cheating tradesman will put one off with bad wares, so the heart will put a man off with seeming grace instead of saving grace. A tear or two shed is repentance. A few lazy desires are faith. Just as blue and red flowers growing among corn look like good flowers, but are beautiful weeds only. The foolish virgins' vessels looked as if they had oil in them, but they had none. Therefore, to prevent a cheat, that we may not take false grace instead of true, we had need make a thorough search of our hearts before we come to the Lord's table. Self-examination is needful because of the false fears which the godly are apt to nourish in their hearts, which make them go sad to the sacrament, as they who have no grace for lack of examining presume, so they who have grace for lack of examining themselves are ready to despair. Many of God's children look upon themselves through the black spectacles of fear. They fear Christ is not formed in them. They fear they have no right to the promise, and these fears in the heart cause tears in the eye. Whereas would they but search and examine, they might find they had grace. Are not their hearts humbled for sin? What is this but the bruised reed? Do not they weep after the Lord? What are these tears but seeds of faith? Do they not thirst after Christ in an ordinance? What is this but the new creature crying for the breast? Here are, you see, seeds of grace. And would Christians examine their hearts, they might see there is something of God in them. And so their false fears would be prevented, and they might approach with comfort to the holy mysteries in the Lord's Supper. Self-examination is needful with respect to the danger of coming unworthily without it. He shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 11.27. As Gracious says, it is as if he were butchering Christ. God reckons with him as with a crucifier of the Lord Jesus. He does not drink Christ's blood. He sheds it, and so brings that curse upon him, as when the Jews said, His blood be upon us and our children. Then the virtue of Christ's blood, nothing is more comfortable. Then the guilt of it, nothing is more formidable. Fourth, we must examine ourselves before the sacrament on account of the difficulty of the work. Difficulty raises a noble spirit. Self-examination is difficult because it is an inward work. It lies within the heart. External acts of devotion are easy. To lift up the eye, to bow the knee, to read over a few prayers is as easy for the papists to tell over a few beads. But to examine a man's self, to take your heart in pieces, to make a scripture trial of your fitness for the Lord's Supper, not easy. Reflexive acts are hardest. The eye cannot see itself but by a mirror. So we must have the mirror of the word and conscience to see our own hearts. It is easy to spy the faults of others, but it is hard to find out our own. Self-examination is difficult with regard to self-love. As ignorance blinds, so self-love flatters. What Solomon says of love, love covereth all sins, is most true of self-love. Proverbs 10.12 A man looking upon himself in the flattering mirror of self-love, his virtues appear greater than they are, and his sins less. Self-love makes a man rather excuse himself than examine himself. Self-love makes one think the best of himself, and he who has a good opinion of himself does not suspect himself. And not suspecting himself, he is not forward to examine himself. The work, therefore, of self-examination being so difficult requires the more impartiality and industry. Difficulty should be a spur to diligence. Fifthly, we must examine ourselves before we come because of the benefit of self-examination. 
the benefit is great whatever way it ends. If upon examination we find that we have no grace in truth, the mistake is discovered and the danger prevented. If we find that we have grace, we may take the comfort of it. He who upon search finds that he has the minimum, the least degree of grace, he is like the one that has found his box of evidences. He is a happy man. He is a fit guest at the Lord's table. He is heir to all the promises. He is as sure to go to heaven as if he were in heaven already. Question. What must we examine? First, our sins. Search if any dead fly spoils sweet ointment. When we come to the sacrament, as the Jews did before the Passover, we should search for heaven, and having found it, we should burn it. Let us search for the leaven of pride. This sours our holy things. Will a humble Christ be received into a proud heart? Pride keeps Christ out. Its presence within blocks the entrance of any other. To a proud man, Christ's blood has no virtue. It's like a cordial put into a dead man's mouth, which loses its virtue. Let us search for the leaven of pride and cast it away. Let us search for the leaven of avarice. The Lord's Supper is a spiritual mystery to represent Christ's body and blood. What should an earthly heart do here? The earth puts out the fire, so earthiness quencheth the fire of holy love. The earth is the heaviest of the elements. It cannot ascend. A soul belimed with earth cannot ascend to heavenly cogitations. Covetousness, which is idolatry, Colossians 3, 5. Will Christ come into the heart where there is an idol? Search for this leaven before you come to this ordinance. How can an earthy heart converse with that God, which is a spirit? Can a clod of dirt kiss the sun? Search for the leaven of hypocrisy. Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, Luke 12, 1. Aquinas describes it as hypocrisy, the counterfeiting of virtue. The hypocrite is a living pageant. He only makes a show of religion. He gives God his knee, but not his heart. And God gives him bread and wine in the sacrament, but no Christ. Oh, let us search for this leaven of hypocrisy and burn it. Second, we must examine our graces. I shall instance one only, our knowledge. We are to examine whether we have knowledge as a grace, or we cannot give God a reasonable service. Romans 12, 1. Knowledge is a necessary requisite in a communicant. Without knowledge, there can be no fitness for the Lord's Supper. A person cannot be fit to come to the Lord's table who has no goodness, but without knowledge, the mind is not good. Proverbs 19, 2. Some say they have good hearts, though they lack knowledge, as if one should say, His eye is good, but it can't see. Under the law, when the plague of leprosy was in a man's head, the priest was to pronounce him unclean. The ignorant person has the plague in his head. He is unclean. Ignorance is the womb of lust, 1 Peter 1.14. Therefore, it is a requisite before we come to examine what knowledge we have in the main fundamentals of religion. Let it not be said of us that unto this day the veil is upon their heart, 2 Corinthians 3.15. In this intelligent age... 1692. We cannot but have some insight into the mysteries of the gospel. I rather fear we are like Rachel, who was fair and well-sighted, but barren. Therefore, let us examine whether our knowledge be rightly qualified. Is it? It is. Is it influential? Does our knowledge warm our heart? Clearness in the understanding breeds zeal in the doing, it is said. Saving knowledge not only directs, but quickens. It is the light of life. John 8, 12. Is our knowledge practical? We hear much. Do we love the truths we know? That is the right knowledge which not only adorns the mind, but reforms the life. Second, this solemn preparation for the pa sa sacrament consists in dressing our souls before we come. This soul dress is in two things. First, washing in the laver of repenting tears. To come to this ordinance with the guilt of any sin unrepented of makes way for further hardening of the heart and gives Satan fuller possession of it. 
They shall look on me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. Zechariah 12.10 The cloud of sorrow must drop into tears. We must grieve as for the pollution, so for the unkindness in every sin which is against Christ's love who died for us. When Peter thought of Christ's love and calling him out of his unregeneracy to make him an apostle and to carry him up to the Mount of Transfiguration where he saw the glory of heaven in a vision, and then of his denying Christ, it broke his heart. He wept bitterly. Matthew 26.75 To think before we come to a sacrament of sins against the bowel mercies of God our Father, the bleeding wounds of God His Son, the blessed inspirations of God the Holy Ghost, it is enough to fill our eyes with tears and put us into a holy agony of grief and compunction. We must be distressed for sin, be divorced from sin. Before the serpent drinks, it casts up its poison. In this we must be wise as serpents. Before we drink of the sacramental cup, we must cast up the poison of sin by repentance. As Augustine says, he truly bewails the sins he has committed, who does not commit the sins he has bewailed. Second, the soul dress is the exciting and stirring up the habit of grace into a lively exercise. I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee, that is, the gifts and graces of the Spirit, 2 Timothy 1.6. The Greek word to stir up signifies to blow up grace into a flame. Grace is often like fire in the embers which needs blowing up. It is possible that even a good man may not come so well disposed to this ordinance, because he has not before taken pains with his heart to come in due order, to stir up grace into vigorous exercise, and though he does not eat and drink damnation, yet he does not receive consolation in the sacrament. Third, a solemn preparation for the sacrament consists in begging a blessing upon the ordinance. The efficacy of the sacrament depends upon the cooperation of the Spirit and the word of blessing. In the institution, Christ blessed the elements. Jesus took bread and blessed it. The sacrament will do us good no farther than it is blessed to us. We ought, before we come, to pray for such a blessing, that it may not only be a sign to represent, but a seal to conform and an instrument to convey Christ and all his benefits to us. We are to pray that this great ordinance may be poison to our sins and food to our graces. As with Jonathan when he tasted the honeycomb and his eyes were enlightened, so by receiving this holy Eucharist our eyes may be enlightened to discern the Lord's body. 1 Samuel 14.27 Thus we should implore a blessing upon the ordinance before we come. The sacrament is like a tree hung full of fruit, but none of this fruit will fall unless shaken by the hand. Of prayer. Part 2. That the sacrament may be effectual to us, there must be a right participation of it, which consists in four things. Number 1. When we draw nigh to God's table in a humble sense of our unworthiness. We do not deserve one crumb of the bread of life. We are poor, indigent creatures who have lost our glory, and are like a vessel that is shipwrecked. We smite on our breasts, as the public and God be merciful to us sinners. This is partaking of the ordinance aright. It is part of our worthiness to see our unworthiness. Second, we rightly partake when at the Lord's table we are filled with breathings of soul and inflamed desires after Christ, which nothing can quench but His blood. Blessed are they which thirst, Matthew 5, 6. They are blessed not only when they are filled, but while they are thirsting. Third, a right participation of the supper is when we receive it in faith. Without faith we get no good. What is said of the word preached, it did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, is true of the sacrament. Hebrews 4.2 Christ turns stones into bread, unbelief turns the bread into stones that do not flourish. We partake aright when we come in faith. Faith has a twofold act, an adhering and an applying. By the first, adhering, we go over to Christ. By the second, applying, we bring Christ over to us. Galatians 2.20 This is the grace we must set to work. Acts 10.43 Philo calls it the eye of faith. 
It is the eagle eye that discerns the Lord's body. It causes a virtual contact. It touches Christ. Christ said to Mary, touch me not, etc. In John 20, 17, she wasn't to touch him with the hands of her body, but he says to us, touch me. Touch me with the hand of your faith. Faith makes Christ present to the soul. The believer has a real presence in the sacrament. The body of the sun is in the firmament, but the light of the sun is in the eye. Christ's essence is in heaven, but he is in a believer's heart by his light and influence. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, Ephesians 3.17. Faith is the palate which tastes Christ's, 1 Peter 2.3. Faith causes the bread of life to nourish, as it's said by Augustine, Believe, and thou hast fed. Faith makes us one with Christ, Ephesians 1.23. Other graces make us like Christ, Faith makes us members of Christ. Fourthly, we partake a rite of the sacrament when we receive it in love. Firstly, love to Christ. Who can see Christ pierced with a crown of thorns, sweating in his agony, bleeding on the cross, but his heart must needs be endeared in love to him? How can we but love him who has given his life a ransom for us? Love is the spiced wine and juice of the pomegranate which we must give to Christ. Song of Solomon 8, 2. Our love to this superior and blessed Jesus must exceed our love to other things as the oil runs above the water. Though we cannot with Mary bring our costly ointment to anoint his body, we do more than this when we bring him our love, which is sweeter to him than all the ointments and perfumes. Secondly, love to the saints. This is a love feast. Though we must eat it with the bitter herbs of repentance, yet not with the bitter herbs of malice. Were it not sad if all the meat we eat should turn to bad humors? He who comes in malice to the Lord's table turns all he eats to his hurt. He eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. 1 Corinthians 11.29 Come in love. It is with love as with fire which you keep all the day upon the hearth, but upon special occasions you make larger. We must have love to all, but to the saints who are our fellow members here, we must draw out the fire of our love larger, and must show the largeness of our affections to them by prizing their persons, by choosing their company, by doing all offices of love to them, by counseling them in their doubts, comforting them in their fears, and supplying them in their needs. Thus one Christian may be an Ebenezer to another, and as an angel of God to him. The sacrament cannot be effectual to him who does not receive it in love. If a man drinks poison and then takes a cordial, the cordial will do him little good. So he who has the poison of malice in his soul, the cordial of Christ's blood will do him no good. Come, therefore, in love and charity. Use 1. From the whole doctrine of this sacrament, learn how precious should a sacrament be to us. It is a sealed deed to make over the blessings of the new covenant to us. A small piece of wax put to a parchment is made the instrument to confirm a rich conveyance or lordship to another. So these elements in the sacrament of bread and wine, though in themselves of no great value, yet being consecrated to be seals to confirm the covenant of grace to us, are of more value than all the riches of the Indies. Use 2. The sacrament being such a holy mystery, let us come to it with holy hearts. There is no receiving a crucified Christ but into a consecrated heart. Christ in his conception lay in a pure virgin's womb, and at his death his body was wrapped in clean linen and put into a new virgin tomb, never yet defiled. If Christ would not lie in an unclean grave, surely he will not be received into an unclean heart. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord, Isaiah 52.11. If they who carried the vessels of the Lord were to be holy, they who are to be the vessels of the Lord and are to hold Christ's blood and body ought to be holy. Use 3. Christ's body and blood in the sacrament are a most sovereign elixir or comfort to a distressed soul. Having poured out his blood, God's justice is fully satisfied. There is in the death of Christ enough to answer all doubts. What if sin is the poison? The flesh of Christ is an antidote against it. What if sin be red as scarlet? Is not Christ's blood of a deeper color and can wash away sin? 
If Satan strikes us with the, his darts of temptation, here is a precious balm out of Christ's wounds to heal us. Isaiah 53, 5. What though we feed upon the bread of affliction, as long as in the ordinance we feed upon the bread of life. Christ received a right sacramentally is a universal medicine for healing and a universal cordial for he cheering our distressed souls. Chapter 6. Prayer. But I give myself unto prayer from the Psalms. I shall not here expatiate upon prayer, as it will be considered more fully in the Lord's Prayer. It is one thing to pray, and another thing to be given to prayer. He who prays frequently is said to be given to prayer, as he who often distributes alms is said to be given to charity. Prayer is a glorious ordinance. It is the soul's trading with heaven. God comes down to us by His Spirit, and we go up to Him by prayer. What is prayer? It is an offering up of our desires to God for things agreeable to His will in the name of Christ. Prayer is offering up our desires, and therefore called making known our requests in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. In prayer we come as humble petitioners begging to have our suit granted. It is offering up our desires to God. Prayer is not to be made to any but God. The papists pray to saints and angels who know not our grievances. Abraham, be ignorant of us. Isaiah 58, 16. All angel worship is forbidden. Colossians 2, 18 and 19. We must not pray to any but whom we may believe in. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Romans 10:14. We cannot believe in an angel, therefore we must not pray to him. Why must prayer be made to God only? First, because he only hears prayer. O thou that hearest prayer from the Psalms, hereby God is known to be the true God, in that he hears prayer. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. 1 Kings 18.37 Second, because God only can help. We may look to second causes and cry as the woman did, Help, my Lord, O King. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? 2 Kings 6.26 and 27 If we are in outward distress, God must send from heaven and save. If we are in inward distress, he only can pour in the oil of joy. Therefore, prayer is to be made to Him only. We are to pray for things agreeable to His will. When we pray for outward things, for riches or children, perhaps God sees these things not to be good for us, and our prayers should comport with His will. We may pray absolutely for grace, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 There must be no strange incense offered, Exodus 30, verse 9. When we pray for things which are not agreeable to God's will, it is offering strange fire. We are to pray in the name of Christ. To pray in the name of Christ is not only to mention Christ's name in prayer, but to pray in the hope and confidence of His merits. Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it, etc., 1 Samuel 7, 9. We must carry the lamb Christ in the arms of our faith, and so shall we prevail in prayer. When Isaiah would offer incense without a priest, God was angry and struck him with leprosy, 2 Chronicles 26, 16. When we do not pray in Christ's name in the hope of his mediation, we offer up incense without a priest. And what can we expect but to meet with rebukes and to have God's answer us by terrible things? Question, what are the several parts of prayer? First, there is the confessory part, which is the acknowledgement of sin. Second, the supplicatory part, when we either deprecate and pray against some evil or request the obtaining of some good. Thirdly, the congratulatory part, when we give thanks for mercies received, which is the most excellent part of prayer. In petition, we act like men. In giving thanks, we act like angels. Question, what are the several sorts of prayer? First, there is mental prayer in the mind, 1 Samuel 1.13. Second, vocal, from the Psalms. Third, ejaculatory, which is a sudden and short elevation of the heart to God. So I prayed to the God of heaven, Nehemiah 2.4. 
fourth, inspired prayer, when we pray for those things which God puts into our heart. The Spirit helps us with sighs and groans, Romans 8, 26. Both the expressions of the tongue and the impressions of the heart, so far as they are right, are from the Spirit. Fifth, prescribed prayer. Our Savior hath set us a pattern of prayer. God prescribed a set form of blessing for the priests in Numbers chapter 6, verse 23. Sixth, public prayer, when we pray in the audience of others. Prayer is more powerful when many join and unite their forces. As it said, a united force is stronger. Matthew 18, 19. Seventh, private prayer, when we pray by ourselves, enter into thy closet. Matthew 6, 6. That prayer is most likely to prevail with God, which is rightly qualified. That is a good medicine which has the right ingredients, and that prayer is good and most likely to prevail with God, which has these seven ingredients in it. 1. It must be mixed with faith, but let him ask in faith. James 1, 6. Believe that God hears and will in due time grant. Believe his love and truth. Believe that he is love and therefore will not deny you. Believe that he is truth and therefore will not deny himself. Faith sets prayer to work. Faith is to prayer what the feather is to the arrow. It feathers the arrow of prayer and makes it fly swifter and pierce the throne of grace. The prayer that is faithless is fruitless. Ingredient two, it must be a melting prayer. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit from the Psalms. The incense was to be beaten to typify the breaking of the heart in prayer. Oh, says a Christian, I cannot pray with such gifts and elocution as others. As Moses said, I am not eloquent. But canst thou weep? Does thy heart melt in prayer? Weeping prayer prevails. Tears drop as pearls from the eye. Jacob wept and made supplication and had power over the angel. Hosea 12, 4. Ingredient 3, prayer must be fired with zeal and fervency. Effectual prayer. Fervent prayer availeth much, James 5.16. Cold prayer like cold suitors never speed. Prayer without fervency is like a sacrifice without a fire. Prayer is called a pouring out of the soul to signify vehemence, 1 Samuel 1.15. Formality starves prayer. Prayer is compared to incense. Let my prayer be set forth as incense from the Psalms. Hot coals were to be put to the incense to make it odiferous and fragrant. So fervency of affection is like coals to the incense. It makes prayer ascend as a sweet perfume. Christ prayed with strong cries, Hebrews 5, 7. As it said, such a cry pierces the clouds, Martin Luther. Fervent prayer, like a powder engine set against heaven's gates, makes them burst open. To cause a holy fervor and ardor of soul in prayer, consider firstly, prayer without fervency is no prayer. It is speaking, not praying. Lifeless prayer is no more prayer than the picture of a man is a man. One may say as Pharaoh, I have dreamed a dream, Genesis 41.15, it is dreaming, not praying. Life and fervency baptize a duty and give it a name. Secondly, consider in what need you stand of those things which you ask in prayer. You come to ask the favor of God, and if you have not His love, all you enjoy is cursed to you. We pray that our souls may be washed in Christ's blood. If He wash us not, we have no part in Him. John 13, 8. When will we be in earnest, if not when we are praying for the life of our souls? Thirdly, it is only fervent prayer that has the promise of mercy affixed to it. Ye shall find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29.13 It is dead praying without a promise, and the promise is made only to ardency. Among the Romans they had their doors always standing open that all who had petitions might have free access to them. So God's heart is ever open to fervent prayer. Fourth ingredient, prayer must be sincere. Sincerity is the silver thread which must run through the whole duties of religion. Sincerity in prayer is when we have gracious, holy ends, when our prayer is not so much for temporal mercies as for spiritual. We send out prayer as our merchant ship that we may have large returns of spiritual blessings. 
Our aim in it is that our hearts may be more holy, that we may have more communion with God, and that we may increase our stock of grace. The prayer which lacks a good aim lacks a good issue. Ingredient 5, the prayer that will prevail with God must have a fixedness of mind. My heart is fixed, O God. Psalms. Since the fall, the mind is like a quicksilver which will not fix. It has, as it said, a principle of restlessness, not of peace. The thoughts will be roving and dancing up and down in prayer, just as if a man who is traveling to a certain place should run out of the road and wander he knows not whither. In prayer we are traveling to the throne of grace, but how often do we, by vain cogitations, turn out of the road? This is rather wandering than praying. You ask, how shall we cure these vain, impertinent thoughts, then, which distract us in prayer, and we fear hinder its acceptance? First, be very apprehensive in prayer of the infiniteness of God's majesty and purity. His eye is upon us in prayer, and we may say, as David, Thou tellest my wanderings. The thoughts of this would make us mind the duty we are about. If a man were to deliver a petition to an earthly prince, would he at the same time be playing with a feather? Set yourselves when you pray, as in God's very presence. Could you but look through the keyhole of heaven's gate, and see how devout and intent the angels are in their worshipping God, surely you would be ready to blush at your vain thoughts and vile impertinences in prayer. Second, if you would keep your mind fixed in prayer, keep your eye fixed. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens, from the Psalms. Much vanity comes in at the eye. When the eye wanders in prayer, the heart wanders. To think to keep the heart fixed in prayer, and yet let the eye gaze, is as if one should think to keep his house safe, and yet let the windows open. Third, if you would have your thoughts fixed in prayer, get more love to God. Love is a great fixer of the thoughts. He who is in love cannot keep his thoughts off the object. He who loves the world has his thoughts upon the world. Did we but love God more, our minds would be more intent upon Him in prayer. Were there more delight in duty, there would be less distraction. Fourthly, implore the help of God's Spirit to fix your mind and make them intent and serious in prayer. The ship without a pilot rather floats than sails. That our thoughts do not float up and down in prayer, we need the blessed Spirit to be our pilot to steer us. Only God's Spirit can bound the thoughts. A shaking hand may well write a line steadily, as we can keep our hearts fixed in prayer without the Spirit of God. Fifthly, make holy thoughts familiar to you in your ordinary course of life. David was often musing on God. When I am awake, I am still with thee. He who gives himself liberty to have vain thoughts out of prayer will scarcely have other thoughts in prayer. Sixthly, if you would keep your mind fixed on God, watch your hearts, not only after prayer, but in prayer. The heart will be apt to give you the slip and have a thousand vagaries in prayer. We read of angels ascending and descending on Jacob's ladder, so in prayer you shall find your hearts ascending to heaven, and in a moment descending upon earthly objects. O oh, Christians, watch your hearts in prayer. What a shame is it to think that when we are speaking to God, our hearts should be in the fields or in our counting houses, or one way or another, running upon the devil's errand. Seventh, labor for larger degrees of grace. The more ballast the ship has, the better it sails. So the more the heart is ballasted with grace, the steadier it will sail to heaven in prayer. Ingredient six, prayer that is likely to prevail with God must be argumentative. God loves to have us plead with him and use arguments in prayer. See how many arguments Jacob used in prayer. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. Genesis thirty-two eleven. The arguments he used are from God's command. Thou saidst to me, return to thy country. Verse 9. As if he had said, I did not take this journey out of my own head, but in thy direction. Therefore thou canst not but in honor protect me. And Jacob uses another argument. Thou saidst, I will surely do thee good, verse 12. 
Lord, wilt thou go back from thy own promise? Thus he was argumentative in prayer. And Jacob got not only a new blessing, but a new name. Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God, and hast prevailed. Verse 28. God loves to be overcome with strength of argument. Thus, when we come to God in prayer for grace, let us be argumentative. Lord, thou callest thyself the God of all grace, and whither should we go with our vessel but to the fountain? Lord, thy grace may be imparted, yet not impaired. God uh, in Christ has purchased grace for poor, indigent creatures. Every gallon of grace costs a drop of blood. Shall Christ die to purchase grace for us, and shall not we have the fruit of his purchase? Lord, it is thy delight to milk out the breast of mercy and grace, and wilt thou abridge thyself of thy own delight? Thou hast promised to give thy spirit to implant grace. Can truth lie? Can faithfulness deceive? God loves thus to be overcome with arguments in prayer. Ingredient number seven. Prayer that would prevail with God must be joined with reformation. If thou stretch out thy hands toward him, if iniquity be in thy hand, put it far away, Job 11, 13, and 14. Sin lived in makes the heart hard and God's ear deaf. It is foolish to pray against sin and then sin against prayer. If I regard iniquity in my heart, says the psalmist, the Lord will not hear me. The lodestone loses its virtue when bespread with garlic. So does prayer when polluted with sin. The incense of prayer must be offered upon the altar of a holy heart. Thus you see what is the prayer which is most likely to prevail with God. Use 1. It reproves first such as pray not at all. It is made the note of a reprobate that he calls not upon God. Does he think to have an alms? who never asks it? Do they think to have mercy from God, who never seek it? Then God would befriend them more than he did his own son. Christ offered up prayers with strong cries, Hebrews 5, 7. None of God's children are born dumb, Galatians 4, 6. Second, it reproves such as have left off prayer, which is a sign that they never felt the fruit and comfort of it. He that leaves off prayer leaves off to fear God. Thou castest off fear and restrainest prayer before God. Job 15.4 A man that has left off prayer is fit for any wickedness. When Saul had given over inquiring after God, he went to the witch of Endor. Used to be persons given to prayer. I give myself, says David, to prayer. Pray for pardon and purity. Prayer is the golden key that opens heaven. The tree of the promise will not drop its fruit unless shaken by the hand of prayer. All the benefits of Christ's redemption are handed over to us by prayer. As the psalmist says, I have prayed a long time for mercy and have no answer. I'm weary of crying. First, God may hear us when we do not hear from Him. As soon as prayer is made, God hears it, though He does not presently answer. A friend may receive our letter, though he does not immediately send us an answer. Second, God may delay prayer, yet he will not deny prayer. You ask, why does God delay an answer to prayer? First, because he loves to hear the voice of prayer. The prayer of the upright is his delight. Proverbs 15.8 You let the musician play a great while before you throw him down money, because you love to hear his music. Song of Solomon 2.14 Second, God may delay prayer when he will not deny it, that he may humble us. He has spoken to us long in his word to leave our sins, but we would not hear him. Therefore he lets us speak to him in prayer and seems not to hear us. Third, he may delay to answer prayer when he will not deny it, because he sees we are not yet fit for the mercy we ask. Perhaps we pray for deliverance when we're not fit for it. Our scum is not yet boiled away. We would have God swift to deliver, yet we are slow to repent. Fourth, God may delay to answer prayer that the mercy we pray for may be more prized and may be sweeter when it does come. The longer the merchant's ships may stay abroad, the more the merchant rejoices when they come home laden with spices and jewels. Therefore be not discouraged, but follow God with prayer. Though God delays... 
he will not deny. Prayer, as it is said, overcomes the omnipotent. Hosea 12.4 The Tyrians tried or tied their god, Hercules, fast with a golden chain that he should not remove. The Lord was held by Moses' prayer, as with a golden chain. Let me alone? Why, what did Moses? He only prayed. Exodus 32.10 Prayer ushers in mercy. Be thy case never so sad. If thou canst but pray, thou needest not fear, says the psalmist. Therefore give thyself to prayer. And thus the reading of Thomas Watson's The Ten Commandments, first published 1692. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 731, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle is adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.